come in in the next few minutes, more people will come in. But um, yeah, so um, welcome to our fourth quarantine mentor talk. Um, just a reminder of our guidelines. We'd love it if you guys all came on camera. Make sure you stayed muted throughout this whole talk um, until the Q&A at the end so there's not extra distraction. And also, if you have any questions, you can put them in the chat. And then at the end in the q and I'll try to remember them. Or if Pete wants, you can look at them as he's going. So Pete, um, Pete was a former director of NASA Ames Research Center and has had many positions with the United States Air Force and was also a professor of astronomy at the University of Arizona, as well as many other things. And I'm super excited to have him today and hear what he has to say. So yeah, without further ado, um, it's really good to see you, Pete. Well, thank you. I'm uh, delighted to be here. I'm, uh, uh, I'm sort of a uh, well, we're, we're less locked down now. I'm uh, located in Luxembourg. Uh, I'd been here for about three months coming back to California uh, next week. You can, you can see it's been a beautiful spring here. There's that, that picture behind me is just outside my apartment in Luxembourg. So, uh, but uh, what, what I'd like to do is, uh, is discuss a little bit about uh, uh, the projects that are privately funded that we, uh, that we manage. Uh, I'll, I'll go through a, a quick presentation. I think I can probably get the, share the screen here in a minute. And hopefully that'll work. Uh, let me see if this works all right. Let's see. Great. Can you all see that? Yeah, it works. Good. Perfect. Perfect. Well, the uh, uh, probably a little bit of history. I. Uh, as noted, I was the director of NASA's Ames Research Center uh, uh, in Silicon Valley. And uh, uh, in 2015, I, I left uh, uh, to work uh, as the chairman of the, of the uh, Breakthrough Prize Foundation. Uh, the, the, I think, I, I don't know if I've got a little bit, uh, well, the, the Breakthrough Prize Foundation was founded in 2011 by a number of high net worth individuals, including uh, uh, Mark Zuckerberg, uh, Sergey Brin, uh, Andrew Zwiski, and a few others, uh, and Yuri Milner was the founding member. Uh, the, you know, to kind of put it bluntly, we're competing with the Nobel Prize. Our, our prizes are bigger, they're $3 million versus a little over $1 million. Uh, but uh, uh, the, uh, my interest, you know, although the prizes are very exciting, is that uh, that uh, in uh, 2015, uh, Yuri Milner started the Breakthrough Initiatives, and he recruited me to to lead these. Uh, these are basically a, a set of efforts where we're we're looking for evidence of life outside the Earth, and I'll talk about in a minute. Uh, the initiatives were announced on July uh, 20th, uh, 2015, at the Royal Society in London. Uh, this is Yuri Milner. Uh, making the announcement, and uh, you will see Stephen Hawking. Uh, he was our uh, uh, principal senior science advisor until he passed away a year and a half ago. And, and much of the thinking about what we're doing is, is due to is Professor Hawking. So it's, uh, it's quite an honor to be working on this program uh, uh, that, uh, that he helped initiate. initiate. Uh, th there's really three fundamental questions that, uh, that uh, we're all about, and uh, these are probably, you know, some of the most exciting questions of science. And uh, uh, the first one is: uh, Is there any other life in the universe? And uh, uh, to remind everybody today, we don't know of any other life. Uh, uh, maybe even more significant: Is there intelligent life elsewhere? Now, whenever I get this, the, put this question up, somebody says, "Well, is there any intelligent life here on Earth?" And, my answer is the closer you get to national capitals like Washington and London, probably not. Uh, but uh, uh, the, uh, uh, at any rate, this is called the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. It's been going on since the 1960s. Uh, and uh, we have not yet found any definitive evidence for, for intelligence elsewhere. But what we're looking for, and I'll talk a little more about this, is what are called techno signatures, evidence of an alien civilization using a technology that would potentially be visible at very great distances. 
Now, the last question is probably to me the most personally exciting. And this is the question is, is can we travel between the stars? And uh, when I say travel, can we send probes? Uh, the, uh, we don't think that in the foreseeable future we'll be sending people, but uh, we do think there's ways that we can send probes to the next nearest star system. And just to remind everybody, the stars are pretty distant. Uh, the next nearest star system is about 300,000 times further away than the sun. That's at 4.3 uh, light years distance. So it's quite a, uh, uh, quite a long distance, but uh, we do think there's technology that can enable us to send probes. I'll tell you a little bit about that. Uh, the first uh, initiative is really to address the question of, is there any other life? And this is called Breakthrough Watch. Uh, the uh, primary objective of Breakthrough Watch is to see if we can find a planet orbiting one of the nearby star systems. Uh, hopefully the nearest star system, uh, which is the Alpha Centauri system, uh, which is, as I said, 4.3 light years away. Uh, we had uh, a major research program that we just completed with the European Southern Observatory uh, that where we tried to directly image the region nearby. Uh, the, 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 the two bigger stars in that system are Alpha Centauri A and B, one's a little bigger than the sun, one's a little smaller. They orbit each other with about an 80 year period. So we looked very carefully to see if we could find a planet. Uh, we did not find a planet orbiting them, uh, but we did, uh, the, the limit of, of our current ability was about four times the size of the Earth. So there, there's quite a lot of room for uh, other other planets to be there. I, I will say that there's the third star in the system called Proxima Centauri, uh, and I'm not sure whether I have a chart on it, but uh, several years ago, a planet was detected indirectly, it wasn't directly imaged, orbiting that star. That star is only about a tenth the mass of the sun, uh, the, but the planet, interestingly enough, is about the same size as the Earth, and it orbits at a distance from, the, from Proxima Centauri that would mean that the conditions on the surface would allow liquid water. That doesn't mean there is liquid water there, but it's a, it's a very exciting effort. We also have some future missions, I won't go into detail, a space mission that we've just started that we're trying to see if we can uh, use a different method to detect planets the size of the Earth in this star system. Now the second program is, 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 uh, is our, has been our largest. We've uh, uh, committed 100 million U.S. dollars to this effort, started in again in 2015. And the idea here was to do a very systematic search of uh, all of the nearest stars. We'd like to uh, look at a million of the nearest stars. Uh, that's a pretty complete sample out to a thousand light years distance to see if there's any signal being sent to us in mostly in the radio, but we're also looking in the optical region. Uh, this is the most comprehensive survey ever made. Uh, we have time on most of the world's large radio telescopes and some of the world's large optical telescopes. Uh, I note in particular two new instruments that we're using. Uh, one is the, the lower uh, left side, is left center, is the uh, uh, newest radio telescope. It's the Meerkat radio array. It's in uh, Karoo, South Africa. Uh, and it eventually will have 2,000 of these small dishes that will have the equivalent uh, gathering power of a kilometer square uh, radio telescope, single one. Uh, the, uh, the other new instrument uh, that we're using is on, on, on the upper right. Uh, that's the brand new 500 meter Chinese uh, telescope. And, uh, What's interesting about that is that it's, they basically hollowed out a valley and it's 500 meters across with a radio telescope. It's the first instrument that we on Earth have ever built that could actually detect transmissions from a television broadcast on the nearest star. Uh, you know, it's been said that since the 1950s, we've been broadcasting I Love Lucy into interstellar space, but if the aliens were broadcasting I Love Gork, this is the first instrument that could pick it up. So a very exciting effort. Uh, this is being led for us by the University of California at Berkeley. 
uh, and there's uh, hundreds of people around the world involved in, in this effort. Uh, and I want to emphasize we do not yet have any signals that we think are, are positive indications of, a, of a alien intelligence. Uh, the third program is, uh, is the Interstellar uh, Probe Program. Uh, Mr. Milner committed $100 million for that, and we've just begun this effort. Uh, the, we announced it in, uh, in 2016 at the uh, New World Trade Center, also with, uh, with, uh, with Stephen Hawking and Yuri Milner. Our objective here is to use a much different method to send uh, probes interstellar distances. Uh, rather than using a rocket, uh, we, uh, which it, any rocket we have could not possibly get us to the speeds we want. We'd like to get to the nearest star system in 20 years. So we need to go about a thousand times faster than we can today, which is about 20% the, the absolute speed limit, speed of light. The only way we can figure out to do that is to make a very, very small spacecraft, about a gram. Uh, we, there's a picture of one of those on the lower left of the picture. Uh, that's a, a, a chipset. Uh, uh, that was actually uh, uh, constructed uh, and a slightly ver larger version was launched by a group of students at Stanford and at uh, Cornell University. Uh, but we would attach that to a, a light sail. It's about a five meter diameter, very thin material that uh, and and have it in space near the earth uh, then we hit that for about 10 minutes with an incredibly powerful laser uh, about 100 gigawatts uh, after about 10 or 15 minutes that accelerates that probe to 20 percent 20 percent the speed of light uh, after 20 years it flies by a planet uh, you, you see an artist's conception on the on the left there of what proxima uh, be the planet that orbits Proxima Centauri might look like. Uh, so this is a very exciting effort. Uh, we are doing basic research on can the lasers be constructed uh, affordably? Uh, can, we, uh, can we build the material that can take that much power? And maybe most importantly, can we communicate back from Alpha Centauri? Now, I'd like to turn to a different topic, which is, is, is pretty fascinating, which is, uh, where did life come from on Earth? And uh, this is sort of relevant as we look for life elsewhere. It would be good to know, did life arise on Earth or did it come here from somewhere else? Now, I'd say most uh, biochemists and astrobiologists would say life arose on Earth about four billion years ago. Uh, the interesting thing is that uh, that, that life was, uh, uh, pretty sophisticated, and the Earth had only cooled from its formation within a couple hundred million years. So some experts say, well, that's not enough time for these very complicated life forms to, to evolve. And in fact, I'll tell you the main reason in a second. Uh, so they suggested that life may have come from elsewhere. This is called panspermia. Uh, and uh, there's, and I'll, as I'll also discuss here in a minute, there's a possibility that not only did life come from elsewhere, but there are some that say that perhaps it was actually planted here by uh, an alien intelligence. Now, the, the, the question of life from space has is, is actually gotten a lot more interesting in the last few years. Uh, in the, uh, uh, the 1990s, a, uh, a meteorite, a piece of rock from space, was found in Antarctica that uh, was known to, as a few others are, to come from Mars. And, and we know this because of the, their gases trapped in the, in the rock that, 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 are, that are identical to what we understand the Martian atmosphere has. Well, how they got here was that, uh, that uh, asteroids hit the Earth, they hit Mars, they hit Venus, and material is thrown into space. And so uh, roughly, uh, uh, Five million years ago, a large asteroid hit Mars and, uh, and knocked off a bunch of material that was in interplanetary space for, for millions of years and then uh, landed in Antarctica a, a few thousand years ago. And uh, uh, because it lands on the ice where there isn't any rocks, if you find a rock on the ice, it's most likely to come from space. Uh, there was some evidence in that rock that 
that, that some scientists claim that, that there were fossilized elements in it that looked like they could have been microbes. Uh, most people now believe that that's not correct, but uh, we do know that material travels between the terrestrial planets. So if there was life on one of the planets, it could have been gotten to another. Now, why do we think that life might have come from elsewhere? And I go to a little more detail here. Uh, as I said, life on Earth began uh, almost four billion years ago. Uh, the uh, we have a pretty good idea of what it the earliest life looked like because we can take all of the genetic uh, information from life forms that exist today and we can track them back to what it's called the the last universal common ancestor and uh, it's called Luca uh, and that emerged very early it was it was you know the, the first life form we know of on earth uh, and it, uh, uh, we pretty much know what its, its genome looks like. We know what the genetic code, and we know what most of the elements of that genome do. Uh, and it was a very sophisticated organism. But the most interesting thing is, is that uh, this is the ribosome. Uh, this is a chemical manufacturing machine that exists in all of our cells and the cells of all life on Earth. It's a very complicated and sophisticated uh, machine and actually a factory. Uh, all the proteins that the cell needs, including the, the proteins for reproduction and messaging, RNA and DNA, are manufactured in these ribosomes uh, using instructions that are transmitted by a RNA molecule. Uh, this is actually a complicated machine. There's actually moving parts in it, uh, all molecular. And uh, the argument is this is pretty sophisticated to have been emerging sort of, you know, very quickly. Now, there are some that say that they think they know how it's done, uh, but there are others that say that it probably took billions of years, not a few hundred million years. Uh, so one of the arguments that life came from elsewhere is that this, there wasn't enough time to produce this uh, complicated machine. Now, until a few years ago, most astronomers would say that that there's essentially no way that, that material can travel between a star system, between like the Alpha Centauri system and ours. Uh, this all changed about two years ago. Uh, there was a interstellar asteroid, the first one that was discovered called Oumuamua, which is uh, Hawaiian for distant traveler, which it certainly was. It came from interstellar space. And uh, it's, it was, since then, we've found a few others, and we've also found some objects that, that look like they came from interstellar space but have been trapped in our solar system. Uh, but this was a very strange object because uh, on its way out of the solar system, it accelerated slightly. It started going faster, where it should have been, been going slower. And uh, uh, now we know of objects that do that, uh, that are in our solar system, like comets, uh, but we know why the comets do that, because when they get close to the sun, it heats up. Uh, they're basically made of ice. It heats up the ice, and, and some of it melts and forms gases underneath the surface, and those break through and will push the, uh, the comet to higher speeds. Uh, now, that could have happened with the Muamua, except we saw no evidence of any, of any, uh, of any gas that, that was outgassing. So that led, uh, and there were some other peculiarities as well, that led this gentleman, this is Professor Avi Loeb, he's the chairman of the astronomy department at Harvard, but he also chairs the advisory committee for us on our, on our Starshot project to suggest that, that Oumuamua looked more like what we're trying to build for, for Starshot is a light sail and uh, uh, behaved more like a light sail. So, he suggested, well, one possibility is that, that it was not just a dead rock, but it was, a, it was a probe that was deliberately sent here, perhaps, you know, you know thousands, if not millions of years ago. And, uh, and now he, uh, most people in the scientific community thought that was rubbish. Uh, Professor Loeb said, well, it's good that he had tenure because uh, nobody was going to fire him uh, as one of the values of the tenure system. Uh, at any rate, it's still a very open question. Now, 
this raised the question of, as I mentioned again, of, uh, of how life got here. Uh, in 1973, one of the, the co-discoverers of, of DNA, the genetic code molecule, was Francis Crick, along with a, a chemist colleague, Leslie Orgel. Uh, they said that maybe life got here not accidentally or formed on the surface uh, of the earth, but it was intentionally put here by an advanced extraterrestrial civilization. And this is called directed panspermia. Uh, so this, uh, this led us uh, to, uh, to, to kind of start thinking about it. So we looked at what we were trying to do with our Starshot program. And uh, uh, again, we, as I mentioned, we were gonna do a Graham class spacecraft. We're gonna leave the engine on the earth so the, uh, and, and use a laser beam to uh, attach the, this, we would attach this, this chip to a light sail of about five meters in diameter. And the, just like a sailboat, the, uh, it would sail in space, although the laser beam would be the wind uh, to accelerate at these high velocities. Uh, so this is a technology that's maturing. We think that by the middle of the century, we'll be able to launch uh, these to, to, uh, to the nearest star systems. Uh, but the, uh, the interesting thing was uh, uh, this gentleman is, uh, is uh, George Church. Uh, he's a geneticist at Harvard. Uh, he was, he's quite famous because he's trying to resurrect woolly mammoths and other extinct species. Uh, but uh, we had a conference at Harvard about a year and a half ago that, uh, that talked about panspermia. And he said, look, I don't care whether life on Earth came from elsewhere. He said, but the technology that we are developing for Starshot with these little chips, if we can figure out how to stop them at the other end, we may, it may enable us to, to, uh, uh, to do what, what some people think aliens did billions of years ago. Uh, so this is an interesting, interesting question of, of, uh, of directed panspermia that, that, that our civilization is beginning to get to the point where not only could we send messages across the galaxy, but we might be able to even plant life uh, on lifeless planets orbiting nearby, nearby stars. Uh, now, you know, this raises the question, maybe in a few millennia, if you did this right, you, you could actually uh, have life-bearing planets nearby. Uh, one of the big questions, of course, is what if there's already life there? Uh, we are planning a series of ethics uh, and policy philosophy conferences to, to consider this because just because we can do it doesn't mean we should do it. Uh, but this is a, as a new technology. Now, let me turn to another topic, which is uh, uh, a little closer to home. Uh, is, uh, is, there, is there life any place else in our solar system? And uh, uh, this has uh, been an open question. Uh, most uh, uh, efforts to date have focused on the planet Mars. Uh, you know, Mars, we know a lot about. We, we believe it had a, uh, an ocean for at least the first billion years of its four and a half billion year existence. Uh, it has, still has a lot of water and uh, uh, there is tantalizing evidence of some chemical process going on under the surface that could be uh, evidence of, of some sort of life form. Uh, but until we actually get there and dig below the surface, uh, the best we can say is that Mars appeared to have conditions where life could have existed or emerged billions of years ago. Uh, but there are other places that we're very interested in as well. Uh, recently, a lot of uh, attention has been paid to two of the moons in the outer solar system. One of them is, is Enceladus, which is a, a moon orbiting the planet Saturn. Uh, when the Cassini mission that got there about 15 years ago, it soon discovered that Enceladus is very strange. It appears to be what's called a water world, that there's a rocky core to it. Overlying it is an ocean that's maybe 10, 20, 30 kilometers thick. And on top of that is an ice crust. Uh, at the bottom of that ocean, there's, there's, it's, it's in contact with the core of the moon, but that core of the moon appears to have volcanic activity and is probably heating the water and uh, could be 
some people believe that's how life started on Earth, was these interface between the ocean and deep undersea volcanic vents. Uh, but the other interesting thing is, is Enceladus, the, the ice cracks at various places, and there are plumes of, of the ocean water that, that, that spray into space. Uh, you can kind of see maybe, I don't know if the picture's good enough, in the bottom of that little white sphere is what looks like plumes of, of water. That's what they are. The Cassini mission was able to study those, and it found that very interestingly, there seems to be very simple organic molecules in it. So one of the places that we might like to go is look and check that water. Now, uh, there's a much bigger object, the moon Europa, uh, orbiting uh, Jupiter. Uh, you see that in the center top. Uh, Europa is also a water world and also has an ice crust over its ocean, but it's uh, somewhat larger than our own moon. Uh, but we've also recently seen that the ice cracks there and uh, also water plumes go into space. So we are looking at potentially a mission that we could privately fund along with NASA uh, that would go study the, those water plumes. There's another moon of Saturn uh, called Titan. It's the biggest moon. It's, uh, uh, you know, almost the size of Mercury. And uh, it's interesting because it's the only moon that has an atmosphere. It has an atmosphere about as thick as the Earth's atmosphere. Uh, the, uh, but more interesting than the atmosphere is on the surface of it, there are lakes, uh, they're, but they're not water, they're liquid ethane and methane. And uh, some people believe there could be really alien life forms that evolved in that location. Uh, NASA has a mission there. Uh, later in the decade called Dragonfly that's going to sort of begin to study that. Now, my favorite place to look, and I'll tell you why in a second, is the, the object on the lower left. So that's uh, uh, the planet Venus. Now, Venus has always been known as sort of Earth's evil twin. Uh, it's about the same size as the Earth, uh, but the surface of it is literally hellish. It's about uh, 500 degrees centigrade. Uh, the uh, uh, it doesn't rotate very fast. Uh, there is, does appear to be volcanic activity on it, uh, but uh, it was sort of dismissed as a place for life, except that, uh, that uh, uh, the Russians had a number of probes there that they sent in the, the 60s to the, uh, the 80s, and they found that, uh, that in the upper atmosphere, at about 50 kilometers above the surface, there's a layer right in the middle of these clouds that uh, where the temperature and pressure is about what it is in this room. It's about one bar of pressure and, and 20 degrees centigrade. Uh, the clouds themselves are, are actually made of sulfuric acid. Uh, so there, some people said, well, it can't possibly be life. Although we note that there's life that exists in some of the most acidic sulfuric acid, sort of the volcanic, uh, 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 hot springs on Earth. Uh, there is some evidence of something strange going on in those clouds. Uh, so there's some interest in maybe we could send something there and see if there is some strange life. Uh, so this is a mission that we're looking at right now. Uh, also be working with various space agencies, including NASA. Now, I want to sort of talk about something very speculative. Uh, about a year ago, uh, the uh, this paper that I've on the top here was handed to me by uh, uh, Science Institute Iki, that's Lev Zelenyi. And uh, as I said, the Russians went to Venus. Uh, they had a number of missions. Two of them actually landed on the surface and took, uh, and took pictures. Uh, the Russians re examined those pictures in the last uh, couple of years and they found they were very interesting. They did image processing. And uh, they found that, and this is some of the data from their paper, that, uh, that there looks to be small little objects that are moving around on the surface. Uh, now this is an incredibly high temperature area, so what could operate there? Uh, it could be this is just rocks that are being blown by the wind. Uh, there are winds in Venus, but they look suspiciously like sort of undersea creatures, and there are a number of them. So the Russians say there may be some really strange, very alien life that operates under a different chemistry than, than our life does, but this is a very interesting. Uh, most most experts think this is wrong, but 
Uh, I mean, this is real data actually taken from the surface. Uh, I'd like to kind of close with an even more speculative thing. Uh, this, uh, this gentleman is Robert Zubrin, one of the most creative folks. And he said that, well, if you really wanted to communicate interstellar distances, you probably wouldn't use radio or optical signals. You might send uh, something that self-replicates. And so he suggested that if aliens really wanted to communicate with us, they might send, uh, you know, some sort of microbial elements, maybe like a virus that, that inserts into our DNA and leaves a message. Now, I suppose some people would say maybe that's what COVID-19 is, uh, but it's not a very friendly message. Uh, at any rate, this is, a, is an idea that, uh, that uh, we are looking at. Uh, we have an annual conference uh, that, uh, uh, that, uh, that we usually hold at Berkeley or Stanford. It, we were planning to hold it uh, in April of this year. Uh, needless to say, we postponed it till 2021. But uh, we called it looking for life in all the wrong places uh, because we haven't really had a good discussion of what is life. We really don't have a good definition. Uh, as I noted uh, in, in my discussion of even our own solar system, there are a lot of strange places that are much different than the Earth that we, we think there could be life here with temperatures that are much different, much hotter like on Venus, uh, much colder like on the, on the moon Titan. Uh, and then finally, the question is, if we ever found life and we thought it might be intelligent, how do you communicate with a really alien alien that's based on some really strange chemistry that, that, that has uh, much, much different thought processes and may even operate at much different timescales? Uh, well, let me, uh, let me uh, sort of uh, stop there and, uh, and uh, be happy to answer any of your questions. Awesome, thank you so much. That was a phenomenal talk. Um, I know a lot of people can't make it today because of finals, but hopefully after finals, everyone will be able to watch the recording. But if anyone has a question, just raise your hand and yeah. Reed? Um, I was interested in the um, bit before about us sending microbes to planets um, in order to start life there. Um, and I was wondering if we had found any planets that would be um, like viable candidates for receiving the kind of life that we have on Earth? Um, uh, uh, not yet. And, and that's, a, that's a good question. That's why we have the Breakthrough Watch program. Uh, we're just now getting instruments that are capable of finding, you know, something that's the size of the Earth that, and, and studying it with enough uh, detail that we can figure out is the atmosphere got gases that could support life. Probably we would, before we would send it, we would have to have these probes fly by first and say that, okay, this looks like a likely place. Uh, and then of course we, you know, we'd like to find, is there evidence of existing life there? Uh, because if there was, you might say, well, we, there's already life there. It's, it may not be a very ethical or appropriate thing to do to, to send our life. Uh, but, uh, uh, there is an idea that has been talked about of, of, of terraforming Mars. And if there isn't life on Mars, that maybe we can put microbes there that, that could begin to sort of convert the, the, you know, some of the environment to more uh, uh, friendly to Earth life. Uh, this has been a discussion, it would probably take many centuries, but, but uh, it would probably use biologically engineered organisms. So this is a this is a very interesting topic that is is, is 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 both terraforming and engineering life and particularly sending it elsewhere. But I, I think the the, the you, know, you know the short answer is no, we don't have a good place yet. But I think we will we will certainly in the next few decades. So I think all of you will be have an opportunity to kind of think about it. All right, thank you. Um, and I have a second question. So you talked about um, I guess quite a few places, even in our solar system, that there might potentially be a source of possibly um, our neighboring world. Um, do you think that there's like a high probability for a lot of these options, where like after we do research and that kind of thing, we're going to find like five different kinds of life and that kind of thing, or is this more like um, we're just hoping that one of them, will, you know, 
might be one to find after a while. Boy, that's a good question. And, uh, you know, uh, I've had many discussions with my colleagues, some over too many drinks, uh, that, uh, that have tried to address that one. Uh, the, the, the five places I mentioned, uh, I think there's probably life under the surface on Mars. Uh, the, I think Venus's upper atmosphere is less likely, but the, uh, there's some very tenuous evidence. Uh, the, the outer moons are, are really alien environments. Uh, it's interesting to me that there is simple uh, organic molecules, which are, are necessary for life, but don't indicate for sure whether it's there or not. Uh, from Enceladus, although Enceladus is a relatively young object, I mean it, it, it or young in its orbit. So, it, you know, if life arises very quickly, then then maybe that'll be proof of it. Uh, Europa is uh, is very interesting. There's no evidence other than it has these interesting conditions. Uh, Titan is completely alien. Uh, so my best guess is we're going to find life under the surface in Mars, maybe sixty percent maybe 30% on Venus and, and maybe 10 or 15% on Europa, Enceladus, and 2% on, on, on Titan. I mean, those are the, 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 you know, I normally don't like to give numbers except that my primary sponsor, Yuri Milner, always insists on a percentage. And of course, most scientists say, oh, no, no, we won't. And then he says, well, if you won't give me any numbers, I'm not gonna give you any money. <laughs> so, so but, but those are the best estimates. I think probably most of my colleagues would agree with you know, that that's not too far off. Yeah, this is interesting. Um, and so my last question is about, um, I guess, the possibility that life on Earth has been started by aliens depositing um, yeah. some type of form of life. Um, is there a possibility that uh, if we, I guess, discover that life couldn't have or would be very unlikely to have occurred on Earth by itself, that it would have accidentally from some other planet? Um, or would that directly imply that it would be an intelligent thing? Well, it's most likely if we figure out that life came from elsewhere, it probably was accidental. Uh, one of the interesting things, and not, not to get into too much of the astronomy, but you know, uh, if you're interested, you know, feel free to communicate more with me, is that uh, uh, the, the sun was formed about four and a half billion years ago, and it was formed in what's called an open cluster. Uh, several thousand stars about the size of the sun were formed in this cloud of gas and dust. Uh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, but early on in the lifetime, this was a cluster of stars that looks, you know, if you look in the sky, there are things like the Pleiades that have, that are open clusters that are, you know, hundreds of millions of years old. The stars are much closer together than, than we are in the general galaxy. Uh, typically today, you know, we're, we're five or 10 light years apart stars. So there's not, there's a low probability, although as we saw from Oumuamua, maybe higher than you think, of material going between the stars. But when they were in the, in the stellar nursery, they were, you know, 10 to 100 times closer. And then it's quite easy for material to mix. So if one of the planets happened to develop life, you know, and now there's thousands of opportunities, then it could possibly have infected the whole cluster of, of stars, uh, which is an interesting question that says that, that that would be a natural thing. And you say, well, if, a, if you know, maybe it was extremely rare, but uh, maybe every star in this cluster that the sun came from was infected with life, to use that word. Uh, so what we've started to do is look, are there other stars that are the, the sun's siblings? And it turns out there is one. It's about 100 light years away. And so we've, you know, it's a little far to be studied yet for planets, but we've certainly started to look if we can, are there any radio signals or anything from it? To, I mean, it's probably unlikely. We haven't detected any, but it's, it's a star kind of like the sun. And uh, so it's a, that's one way they could have been. Uh, you know, the other thing is that, you know, if, if it was 4 billion years ago, uh, the question is, is there any signal still left? I mean, did the, if aliens planted it here, would they have left a signal? And so that's one of the purposes we have these conferences to say is, 
what if we wanted to plant life someplace and then billions of years in the future, anything that emerged from it might be able to read our message that says, hi, uh, you know, we're gone now, but we, uh, we, uh, we helped you get started. And, uh, you know, the big argument, it's very hard over billions of years to, to preserve uh, genetic code other than, that, than maybe the basic physics of it, uh, the fact that it has a ribosome and other things. So, you know, that's a, it's an open question, which we think is very exciting of, you know, connecting, you know, biology and chemistry and genetics and so forth. So, uh, don't know. Yeah, that's super interesting. And thank you for coming. I'm very happy, happy to help. Lexi says, could the idea of sending humans to different planets be viable in the future? And then she says, with that, could we introduce different animals into other life systems and communities on other planets? Because I'd assume it would disturb a lot, but is there a way? Well, this is a very interesting question. Indeed, I'm convinced that, that, that very quickly that we're going to start setting up human settlements on, on other places. Starting with the moon, now the, the moon is, is, appears to be absolutely lifeless and everything we understand. So what uh, the idea is, you would set up a settlement, which would be uh, in a kind of a habitat you construct like a giant space station. And uh, the idea there is that, that, you know, to make it viable, you would like to send uh, uh, not just humans, but, uh, you, know, you know, the best way to process the air is with plants. And uh, you would probably eventually try to set up an Earth environment. Uh, so that... Uh, uh, you, you might find in 20 or 30 years, there'd be a, a colony that's uh, quite large on, on the moon and uh, that uh, uh, would exist in, in domes and things, but it could be quite a uh, earth-like environment with plants and animals and, and, uh, and so forth. Uh, the planet Mars is actually more promising in the long term because there's a lot more water. There, there's a tiny bit of water on the moon uh, in the poles. Uh, so Mars potentially could support much, much larger populations. Uh, Elon Musk uh, certainly plans on, on putting a colony there in probably the 2030s. And uh, certainly, again, we would expect that, that we would try to build those to be as Earth-like as possible with plants and animals and so forth. Uh, I think eventually we'll probably genetically engineer the plants and animals and maybe even ourselves to survive better. Uh, the, uh, we're not sure completely yet what partial gravity does to life systems. Uh, the moon is a sixth gravity and, and Mars is a third gravity. We don't even know that most that animals and plants or us can reproduce that easily on it. But we think plants can because we've done some experiments in the space station. Uh, the, the third idea, which is probably going to happen fairly soon, is uh, uh, maybe in the 2040s, is Jeff Bezos has been pushing, the Amazon CEO and, and big space enthusiast. Uh, he, he took an idea that first came up in the 1970s that uh, by a professor at Princeton, uh, Jerry O'Neill, who said, well, rather than live in, in, uh, on the moon or Mars, which aren't probably terribly nice, at least to start with, uh, he said, why not build a giant rotating space station, a, a, a cylinder that's uh, that eventually might be, you know, a kilometer or more in diameter and tens of kilometers long and would rotate. It would have giant windows. And, and on the inside surface, as it was rotating, you would have artificial gravity. You would have gravity, you know, by the centrifugal force that would be one gravity. And we could construct those things as a, uh, as a uh, 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 perfect environment. In fact, I think there was a science fiction movie a few years ago. What was it called? Uh, Elysium, and uh, the, uh, uh, that, that talked about that. So the question is, I don't know which of those three are going to be, uh, going to be most uh, uh, likely, but I think all of them are. So certainly in our own solar system, the idea that we can send humans and, and animals and plants is, is uh, it's all going to happen in your lifetimes. Um, Mark. Hi, uh, thank you for that presentation, by the way. It was really interesting. I was just wondering, since we're talking about sending and receiving uh, signals, 
wasn't there a uh, wow signal in 1977? It, it was, you know, relatively famous because it was a big burst that we didn't expect. Um, what, is there an agreed upon kind of like explanation for it or is the wow signal still a mystery? No, I'm glad you mentioned it. Uh, uh, the, uh, in, in 1976, there was a, a, a radio telescope at Ohio State University called the Big Ear. And it, uh, uh, it detected a, uh, a signal and it was actually a volunteer who noted it. And it was, a 30 se- uh, it was about 30 seconds of, of burst. It was never repeated. And it had all of the features of what we thought an alien signal would look like. Uh, I mean, there's, there, there wasn't any particular information in it other than that it did not appear to be of terrestrial origin. And, and, you, and you figure that out based on, you know, the, the frequency structure and as the Earth rotated. Uh, there's nothing at the position where it was. There's no star or, or planet or anything. Uh, I'd say most experts uh, would say that it was interference from something on the Earth, maybe bouncing off the moon or other places or a satellite. Uh, the, uh, uh, there's a, 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 an expert, I uh, think like Robert Gray, who's written a number of books, and he thinks it really was evidence of, a, of an alien signal. So when I said there's nothing validated, uh, there is the wow signal. Uh, there were a few others that aren't nearly as impressive. Uh, but uh, one of our ideas is to have a much more systematic way. At that time, you know, you would see something, there wasn't any way to alert anybody else to look right away. Well, now we have, by having all of these radio telescopes and some optical telescopes, if we see anything, uh, we have interconnected. So we can tell people, immediately turn your, uh, turn your system on and look here. So uh, if there, if, you know, if there are signals uh, like that and they're, and they're not just one time in a billion years, we'll find them. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Um, I was actually wondering how you got into astronomy in the first place, because a lot of people are like wondering which career path they should go into, and I think that would be really interesting to know. Sure. I, you know, I'm an old guy. I'm 70. Uh, so I grew up in the 1950s, and, and uh, uh, the, uh, the, the first two books my mother got me were, one of them was called Planets and the other was called Stars. And I thought the stars were much more interesting. I thought, you know, our solar system was kind of boring because there, you know, there weren't any cool aliens. That's one reason I'm looking for aliens. And, uh, but uh, ever since I was, uh, you know, uh, in the 1950s, I was very excited about astronomy. I told her that I wanted to be an astronomer. Well, then in the 1960s, I grew up during the Apollo program which was a, uh, uh, everybody wanted to be an astronomer when I, I, I was an undergrad at the University of Michigan in 1967. And there were 200 people that were gonna be astronomy majors. And uh, it turned up, six, in the end, only six of us got you know, astronomy degrees. And uh, two of us ended up getting PhDs. And I think I'm the only one still working on it. But uh, uh, it was a, a really great, I mean, I've had a wonderful career because uh, they've done a lot of other things, but Astronomy is a is a, even if you don't continue in it, it, uh, it 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 connects so many different areas, and now it's connecting biology with the astrobiology program to look for alien life. So, but to me, it was always incredibly exciting to see what was, you know, not only beyond the next hill, but what was beyond the hills beyond it, and uh, that uh, I always found that very exciting, and it's uh, it still is. And it, uh, you know, hopefully we're on the verge of, of finding life elsewhere. Uh, so we find that, that, that beyond the most distant hills is, is something that's even more exciting. That's super cool, thank you. Um, Sophia? Hi, um, thank you so much for sharing this. It's been really, really interesting. Uh, I just had a few questions. So one of those was, could anybody born on these new worlds or like different anywhere besides the Earth ever return because of the differences between like atmospheric pressure and I think the slightly different gravities on those planets? So could they be able to actually return to Earth? And then I had another question, but I'm blanking on it. So thank you so much again. Well, that, that's a very interesting question, and we don't really know what uh, you know 
especially in multiple generations, what living in another world would be. Now, if we constructed an environment that was, that was like the earth in terms of temperature and pressure, then obviously there wouldn't be a problem there. But one of the, the things that we do know is that, is that, that human bodies and, and actually other animals, uh, if, they, if they live in zero gravity, the body begins to fall apart. You know, the, the, the bones begin to dissolve and other there are neurological problems and so forth. Now, those can be minimized. Uh, so we're pretty sure that living in zero gravity is probably, you know, at least humans and, and most animals and probably plants are not going to be able to do that. The thing we don't know is what partial gravity does. It does one sixth gravity is that as good as a full gravity? And uh, this is one of the great mysteries. So one of the first things I think that we'll want to do as we go to the moon or Mars is to start looking at research with animals and 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 do they uh, is there problems can they come back uh, now of course one of the solutions would be that you know that you uh, maybe only live there part-time uh, another solution is you have these artificial space stations that rotate and have real earth-like conditions so so that's just an open question it's uh, you know there's not a good answer yet I think the answer would be yes that it won't be a problem Although I, I have to tell you that I suspect if you were born and raised on the moon and you came back to the earth and it was six times the gravity, uh, you would say, this place really is horrible. <laughs> I want to go back home. You know, on, on the other hand, it's, I, you know, that when you talk to an astronaut, they say living in, in zero gravity is really fun. And, and uh, you know, I talked to a few of the astronauts that went to the moon and they said it was really neat to kind of hop around the moon and, and feel like super, super people. So. We'll see. Okay, that makes sense. And then also, how can we tell, so if an alien, uh, if any alien worlds are trying to communicate with them, how can we tell the difference between like an FRB or even like a pulsar signal and a, some alien communication? Well, that's, a, that's exactly the key thing. In fact, when people saw the FRBs, the fast radio burst, you know, they initially said, well, maybe they're alien signals. Uh, and, and in fact, when the pulsar was discovered in the 1960s, uh, the uh, uh, Jocelyn Bell Burnell, the graduate student that discovered it, she she labeled it LGM for Little Green Men. And uh, uh, so, whenever we find a new phenomenon, there's always the initial question: is is can it be an alien signal? Usually, uh, in fact, essentially always that we find that well, there's a much better explanation. It's some natural physics. But what we're looking for is, first of all, evidence that something is clearly outside the Earth, and we really want to see it long enough to tell by the, the fact that the Earth is rotating around the sun, that it's, that it's outside our solar system. Uh, so that's the first thing. And, and most of the signals we see, in the end, you find that they're not outside the solar system. In fact, most of them are not even outside the Earth. Uh, but then we, then we go through and look for, uh, you know, that, that we're looking for very narrow frequencies. The, the physics processes we understand tend to produce broad frequency distributions, not narrow signals. Uh, and they also tend to have time behavior that's, that, 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 that's fairly slowly changing. If this thing changes rapidly, uh, then that may indicate uh, artificial signals. So that, but that's one of the, the, big, the big, big questions is, uh, uh, there's a, uh, if, if you look at the, uh, the uh, uh, Berkeley SETI, the UC Berkeley, the Breakthrough Listen website they have there at the program, they go through some of the, the, the detailed methods they use to figure out if they're alien signals. Okay, cool. That makes a lot of sense. Uh, thank you so much again. And then I just had one more final question. Sorry about sure. that. Um, how does... So is any of the satellites around Earth and all of the signals being sent between the Earth and satellites interfering with our observations of any radio base bursts or anything extra, like outside of Earth? Uh, that, that is a fabulous question. Those signals from satellites are incredibly interfering. And uh, it's, it's one of the real problems of radio astronomy. And, and pretty soon it's going to be a problem with optical astronomy. You know, Mr. Musk going to put tens of thousands of satellites in his Starlink 
and that will make the night sky pretty bright for at least astronomers. Uh, so it's a serious issue. One of the things that we have talked about, and, uh, and this, in fact, I've been involved in this, is if the best place to look for alien signals, as well as some scientific signals, is on the far side of the moon. The, the moon actually is big enough, it blocks the, the, all the radiation from the Earth and the, and the civilization. Uh, but of course, people are talking about putting things in orbit around the moon, so we need to make sure we do that, that we have a radio quiet region. That, uh, that we think that's our best opportunity to, to see something. And so we're looking at some actual, some near-term experiments that we would put at least a satellite in orbit around the moon that when it's shielded uh, from the earth, it would look for these signals. Uh, there is another thing that it can look for as well. There's the, the radiation from the earliest universe. You know, the universe was formed, uh, you know, roughly 14 billion years ago. Uh, and the, the first few hundred million years, we don't know anything about. Uh, those are called the dark ages. Uh, but we believe there is, there's radio signals in the very low frequency radio range that actually probe that earliest period. And uh, so there's, there, there are programs at NASA and other space agencies, uh, I think the Chinese and others are looking at, that we would, uh, we would put uh, probes to, to detect those radiations that we think we'll because that's a very interesting period. That's when, you know, atoms uh, first were formed and so forth. So if we can find something out, it might tell us something about our, our, the, our early evolution in our universe. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you so much. Thank you. Wrap, but thank you so much. All right, I think it's a wrap on our mentor talk, but thank you so much. This was super inspiring and I think we all really enjoyed it. Well, thank you. If there's any questions, uh, you know, uh, you, you know, uh, well, you have my email. I'll be happy to to answer more things by email. Awesome! Thank you so much. See you guys all next week, and I really enjoyed having you. All right. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye.